if you invested in crypto last year, well, number one, get out now. But number two, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, well done. <laughs> you know, great. I wish I had it. You know, I'm jealous. But, but you know, so I think there, I think there is a, a space for do-it-yourself trading, but it's only if you have an interest in that and you're prepared to, to follow that interest. And the way you worded it, you said, do you think it, it has a place in managing your family finance? Definitely not. No, it's not, it's not a place to go around playing with the family finance. This episode is part two of our conversation with Dr. Steve Garth. Steve is the principal of Principia Investment Consultants and is a member of our Stefan Independent Advisory Investment Committee. In this episode, we continue to unpack investing and the decision-making around dipping into the stock market. We talk about the pros and cons of private equity, do-it-yourself trading, green investments, and asset investing. If you haven't already listened to part one, I encourage you to have a listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts. And also a reminder, that this information about investments is of a very general nature and is not to be considered as personal financial advice. Well, thanks for joining uh, us, Steve. Um, I'm really privileged to have you on. I wanted to address with you the idea that you um, would prescribe to the idea of being an asset class first, market-based type investor. Can you explain a little bit about what that actually may look like? Yeah, I, I think um, just to go up a, a, a level, yep. Joe, yep. is, again, the power of diversification. And by that, I mean investing in um, one share. I, I have no idea what that one share is going to do, no matter how well you know that business, no matter how well you know you know the general manager of, the, of that company, investing in one share is speculative, mm -hmm. highly risky. Mm -hmm. Investing in, in 50 Australian shares, um, typically not too bad. You'll probably get pretty close to uh, what's called the index, you know, the All Lords or the ASX 300, you know, particularly if you own those big companies, the banks and Telstra, you're probably going to do okay. But the more diversifier you are, the better your result will be and the more consistent your result will be. So when we're talking about more diversified, we're talking about being more diversified in Australia, so owning even more companies in Australia. And of course, this doesn't mean buying them bit by bit by bit. It means investing in a fund, going to a financial advisor and getting advice in the appropriate fund or, or the appropriate ETF to buy. An ETF, by the way, is an exchange traded fund, but it's a collection of stocks that are wrapped up into a single stock, if you yep. like. Yep. And these give you a broad exposure to the Australian market. So you pick up the banks, you pick up, you know, the IT, you pick up the resource sector, you do all of that. And basically, well, not basically, you will get in a good diversified portfolio, you, you will get the return of, you know, the ASX 200 or 300. Now, but Australia's one market, it's a fine market, but there's a whole range of other opportunities out there in other markets and you mentioned uh asset classes and sectors before joe so i'm sure probably most of the listeners are aware that it's the australian market's what we call quite concentrated there are two major sectors financials and resources so depending on how the banks go and depending on how bhp and rio go really determines how the australian market will will perform over time but they're about the only two sectors we've got. Something like the IT sector in Australia is tiny. So while we hear about afterpay, the whole IT sector in Australia is about 4% of the overall market. But when you go overseas, if you go to the US, well, the IT sector there is about 25% of the market. It's a significant part of the market. And here we're talking about the companies like Google and Apple and Microsoft, which have done extraordinarily well over the last couple of years and obviously benefit from the pandemic. So moving away from Australia, you pick up all these different sectors, manufacturing, uh, you know, IT, healthcare sectors. You know, in Australia, we've got CSL that sort of dominates our healthcare sector. 
but obviously as you expand you've got the Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson you've got biotechs as well as big farm uh, the big pharma pharmaceutical firms so the more diversified you are then the more you're going to get the benefits of the capital markets the global capital markets working in your favor. Mm -hmm. And of course, diversification includes going into the emerging markets. But if you're going to invest in the emerging markets, you want to do it mm -hmm. in a diversified way. You don't want to own one Chinese company, you know, or yes. one Malaysian company. You want to have a broad exposure to the emerging markets as you want a broad exposure to developed markets, as you want a broad exposure to the Australian market. So that's the equity side of the equation, Joe. Stay diversified, you know, diversify broadly and do it in a, a, a low cost way. Um, and again, for long term investments, trying to pick stocks is, is, it is a hard way to go about achieving a goal which has uh, got a much more certain outcome by investing in a diversified pool of stocks. And I think that it, it's, it is that context that um, I think makes sense to um, or, or, or adds to your comments earlier around if there are situations, um, geopolitical situations um, that occur that have impact markets, the ability to be patient and wait for recoveries um, should be on should be on everyone's minds. Um, and, and, um, and, and that's based upon this idea that we broadly invest, we invest with diversity um, and um, not as an example, have a, 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 you know, a five stock portfolio um, to house all of our critical capital. Right. That, that, that's absolutely right. And again, for people who are, are, are running businesses and are used to uh, taking the risk in setting up their own business and running their business, I always feel, Joe, that that's your expertise is setting up that business, running that business and growing that business. So stick to what you're good at. Yep. And with the capital, the other capital that you have, the other wealth you have, just put that aside into a diversified, low cost, mm -hmm. you know, see a financial advisor and enjoy the benefits of what capital markets return. Because you've got it, you've picked up a very um, a great idea, and it's a great segue into the idea that business owners are inherently entrepreneurial, or most of them are, right? Absolutely. And yep. the entrepreneurial mindset is great, where you have control over your business and you have control over those certain outcomes. Or there are more controllable factors there. When it comes to passive investment, you're handing it a lot of the time over to somebody else. So an entrepreneurial mindset in that space is not as advantageous. Is it? So when we talk about private no. equity, you know, I mean, the, yeah. the person's, the business owner's business is effectively private equity. So right. talk to us around that. Yeah. So uh, private equity has become very popular, uh, particularly in the last 10 years, uh, and particularly as um, sort of rates have got very low. And so investment in sort of more well-known investments like bonds um, ha have not returned um, what people were used to in the past. And so this idea of private equity has become very popular. So obviously private equity is almost as it says, where investing in the stock market is public equity. Uh, you can buy and sell, you know, at ease. Private equity is investing uh, privately. And typically the way you do that, unless you want to go out and individually buy a bit of a company yourself, that's probably quite different because when you do that, I'm sure that anyone doing that is running the ruler over the books and understanding what they're doing. If you go to a private equity manager, and these are really what I'm talking about, Joe, and they have become quite popular. But again, what you're doing is then you're outsourcing the investment into different private companies. You're outsourcing that to another manager or, or to a manager. Um, and so you're suddenly removed from which company you want to in, invest in. So you think about venture capital, which, it, which is probably one of the best examples of private equity, because a venture capital is really where you, you're setting, uh, investing in startups. It's almost like a, 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 an angel investor, they call it. You know, to get a business up and running, you need this initial investment. And if the business works out, then eventually it'll get listed and, you know, then you'll be able to um, gain all the benefits of a very small unlisted company becoming a very large listed company. Well, well, that's the dream 
but obviously um, not every small, tiny company grows in into a, a, a big one. And so when you go into private equity or you go into venture capital, you've outsourced that decision about who or which companies you're going to invest in to other people. And so you, you now got that, you're now, you're now no longer in control mm. of the investment. So it's quite different from being a business owner who's got your own business and you understand the risks, the opportunities, uh, the threat in, in that business. And while the idea of investing in venture capital might seem attractive because, well, they're all going to be like me, right? The trouble is you've, out, you've stepped away from, from that decision. Yeah. Um, and now there, there are pros and cons to private equity, Joe. Some of the pros are, it is true that the returns um, ha have been higher over time. Um, and it kind of makes sense because it's more risky. You know, you're investing in in things that, you know, uh, are not being priced by by the rest of the market. So there is there's a higher element of, of true risk in that. When you talk about venture capital, um, I was speaking to a venture capital manager the other week, um, and they've actually been very successful. And he says uh, they're based in California. Uh, and so obviously their opportunity set of investing in startup IT is is sort of everywhere. Every garage has got a startup IT going on in it. Mm -hmm. But he said, well, look, we, we limit ourselves to only 30 startups that we want to invest in because we want to be diversified. So we're not just investing in a single startup. And so I, I, I like this straight away. Um, but he said, the reason why we invest in 30 startups is that in our... Um, our knowledge, our history, and we've been doing this collectively, this group of guys have been doing startups in California for 30 years. He says, oh, of the 30, uh, there's only 16 or 17 that work. The other 14 or 13 fall over. And, and, he that's, says, if you know, and that's if they're good managers. Yeah, and, and that, that's right. And, and, he, and that's how fine it is between being successful mm -hmm. and making, you know, and they've had great returns, fantastic. Mm -hmm. But he said it's always just cutthroat of the 30 startups that we invest in, only about 16 actually get going and, and make it to something where we can make a profit and pull the money out in time. So the advantages or the pros, if you like, of a, a private equity investment, Joe, is that yes, potentially there is a higher re return there. But there's also cons in it. Obviously, one of the disadvantages is the higher risk, no doubt. The other disadvantage, though, is typically in private equity, well, not typically, almost certainly, you're going to lock your, your money up. The advantage of being in a diversified pool of stocks and bonds that, you know, are bought on an exchange is that you can buy and sell and, you know, realise the capital out of that at any, any mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. If you invest in private equity firms, the lockup period is typically between three to five years. So again, for the sophisticated investor, that might be something that they are prepared to do. But again, I would do that to an earlier point we made with with, with a small amount of money as on. part of as part of a you know a, a core portfolio. You know, as, like as part of right. part of a very diversified listed portfolio. It could it could be a part of it, but only it a small part. Could be part. a part of it. That's absolutely right, Joe. It's yeah. a small part. Yeah. And again, it's are you prepared? To not get your money back from from this and, it, and that's exactly. always the gauge always the gauge is are you prepared not to get your money back yeah right. so so steve I've, I've, I've you know really want to um i think i think we know that um australians have this kind of um love affair with do it yourself so do it yourself in the garden going to bunnings working out you know how to do certain uh, home renovations and so on um do you think do-it-yourself investment has a place in um, the family's finances? Uh, the short answer is no, because of the way you phrased that in, in the family's finances. I would say absolutely not. Does do-it-yourself trading have a place in your life? Perhaps. Do you like doing crossword puzzles? Do you like doing Sudoku? Is, is that part of your enjoyment? Do you like following the market and reading about the market? Is that part of your enjoyment? If that's the case, then there is 
a small part that should be devoted, or that, that, that could be devoted to investing in do-it-yourself trading. But this always comes back to our point that we, you know, we've touched on throughout this, Joe, is that it's got to be the bit that you're prepared to lose. It's like investing in that cryptocurrency, the Bitcoin we talked about before. It's speculating. So if, you know, my, my, I guess the point I'm trying to make is, is, is that having, a, 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 having an interest in doing Sudoku puzzles or doing this or doing that, you know, boy, having an interest in what the stock market's doing, it's, that's healthy, that's great, let's mm, do it. Mm. But you, it, it's got to be uh, only a very small part that goes into the do-it-yourself trading. And if it works out for you, and, you know, if you invested in crypto last year, well, number one, get out now. But number two, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, well done. <laughs> you know, great. I wish I had it. You know, I'm jealous. But, but you know, so I think there, I think there is a, a space for do-it-yourself trading but it's only if you have an interest in that and you're prepared to, to follow that interest and the way you worded it you said do you think it, it has a place in managing your family finance definitely not no it's not it's not a place to go around playing with the family finance so, so you're an you're an, you're an investment uh, manager of, of or you've worked in investment institutions global investment institutions been head of portfolios and funds management um you know, when it comes to the handling of your own money, how do you do it? Oh, I outsource it, Joe. I don't look at it. You know, I have uh, I have superannuation. Um, in fact, I don't do um, uh, self-managed super either. I'm with a, uh, a superannuation fund that I've been with, you know, forever. Mm -hmm. um, and um, So you're and telling me you don't DIY your own investments, even though that you no. would, if anyone had the competency to do so, it would be uh, yourself? Yeah, no, it, I, 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 I don't have the energy or the interest, Joe. I know that my superannuation is earning the return of the capital markets and it's doing wonderfully well and, you know, may, may long it stay there um, and, and, and until I need it. There's no point in me. Um, I, I, I can't add any value to what's being done there, Joe. My, my, my job a, a, as an advisor is to stop people doing stupid things. There's no such thing as an optimal portfolio. There's no such thing as, you know, the perfect portfolio, which will shoot the lights out of the market this year. And then, you know, we'll be able to read the tea leaves and get out of that and buy something else. Next, It just, life doesn't work that way, even though, investment managers want to tell you it does and the papers want to tell you who's the best manager. It, it just doesn't work that way. Unfortunately, um, no one knows what's in the future. So the best thing you can do, uh, and this is what I do, is have a low cost diversified, you know, um, superannuation fund. And that looks after my super. Seems to me though, as well, and the one thing that we haven't addressed in this whole DIY uh, conversation is really around the idea that how can you be objective with your money when it is your money? I, I, I think that's absolutely right, Joe. Now, the, the, there's two. There's a difference here between self-managed super, which typically, uh, hopefully, everyone goes to see a financial advisor to get their self-managed super, and you know they end up in uh, in a in a in a. Um, a really good portfolio. I do know there was a recent report that a lot of self-managed super funds that haven't gone through a financial advisor, they're sitting at about 40%, 30 or 40% in cash because people are scared of the market. And you go, if you're scared of the market, why do you set up a self-managed super fund for? So they're sitting in cash, which is just, you know, doing nothing. You know, the market uh, last year, Joe, last financial year market was up 28%. You know, you're just missing out again, on what the capital markets are, are offering um, by sitting in, in cash, but that's not advice to anyone. No. Um, the, and the trouble, with, so again, the trouble with do it yourself, yeah, you can't be objective to it, you know, and, and again, there might be, again, I'm, I'm not opposed to having a flutter at the casino and that's how I look at do it yourself trading. I'm not opposed to getting the whisper at the barbecue and going, yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. I'm going to stick in a few bucks here, but make sure it's a few bucks. It's not. It's not the family's mm. um, um, wealth. Uh, again, you, you you want to have the interest in in doing that if you want to do it yourself trading. Mm. I, I have another great anecdote, Joe, that when um, the government did allow you to take that 
$10,000 out of superannuation. Uh, the ABC uh, interviewed some rugby league player from Queensland who said, this is great. I'm going to get this money out of super and invest it in the stock market. In other words, he had no idea what it was doing, you know, in his superannuation. Now, I shouldn't laugh at him because for all I know, if he did in actually invest it in March 2020, he's probably done really well. But it, it was just... It yeah. was just funny that he'd taken it out of super going, this is great. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, and this was at the, um, at the height, sorry, of, of really your point, I guess. Mm -hmm. It was at the height of the, um, uh, the GameStop and, um, yeah, right. what was there? Yeah. You know, AMC yeah. theaters, which yeah. have been closed, have, yeah. Yeah. have had a run. So the whole Robin Hood, which again is back in the news because they're now listing and people are going, this is great. So the whole Robin Hood craze in the US was hitting Australia as well. Mm -hmm. And so people who had never thought about investing in the stock market before, suddenly working from home, got a bit more time on their hands. Mm -hmm. The boss wasn't watching them. So they were using their screen to see what's going on. Yep. Um, you know, number one, that's the wrong thing to do. You know, if you, if you are going to play... Um, in the stock market, my, my firm belief here is, you know, you do it in the same way you do a crossword puzzle or, you, you know, you devote an hour yeah, of yeah. time to doing yeah. it in a small amount of time. You're not sitting there during the day yeah. um, when you're meant to be, you know, adding to the productivity of, of, of the business you work for. Yeah. But, you know, that was the craze um, back then. Uh, and so that was that was a fun story about the rugby league player who took his money out of the stock market because he didn't know it was in the stock market and said, yeah. I'm going to get involved in this Robin Hood. Um, so, yeah, I, I, again, you probably get the idea that I, I, I'm not opposed to it, but only if it's only if it's play money, literally play money. It's not what you want to do with your wealth is play around with do it yourself trading. Yep. So maybe a bit of a change of um, a change of topic, but something certainly um, you know that's uh, I suppose contentious at the moment, or or is uh, is an issue that people are talking about. Um, are you any uh, concerned about the sustained increase in infl in inflation over the longer term and um, corresponding increase in interest rates? Are you concerned with any of that? Um, the the short answer is no. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, let me put that out a little bit more or let me let me uh, expand on that a little bit for you joe at the moment um well in sydney we're not seeing it because we're not allowed to go out and shop but actually prices are, are, are have popped a little bit mm -hmm. so in other words uh, prices from a range of goods and services uh, have been going up mm -hmm. and the market got wind of this back in february and so suddenly the market started talking about interest rates would have to go up mm -hmm. and long bond yields did went up. They went up quite a lot in February. And this was on the fear that inflation was back. So inflation's more or less disappeared for the last mm, couple of years. Be before the pandemic, inflation had dropped to, to levels under the RBA's band, which is a two to 3% inflation. And so those those levels have dropped right down. We haven't really seen inflation or have we seen any sign of future inflation up until recently, up until just a few months ago, where suddenly the signs of inflation were around and the market reacted really quickly and said, whoa. And of course, the media loved this stuff. And the media went, whoa, this is great. I can write all sorts of stories about it's the end of the world as we know it, because interest rates are going to go up. Now, for many um, investors, Joe, have been struggling to find an income at a low interest rates, they're probably going, this is great, interest rates are going up, you know, I, I, but if interest rates go up suddenly, that's actually bad, because a lot of businesses are, are, are leveraged. And obviously, you're aware of the high prices of houses uh, in Australia, but actually are, are around the world. And those prices are high, partly due to the fact that low interest rates have allowed people to borrow a lot of money. And if interest rates go up, suddenly, uh, then the repayments get beyond the means of people who have borrowed money. And this works for companies as well as for individuals. And so mm -hmm. the fear is with really high skyrocketing inflation, in order to bring that under control, central banks have to raise interest rates suddenly. And that will cause this massive effect where, you know, stocks, bonds will fall over, stocks will fall over, house prices will fall over. You know, it's the end of the world as we, as we know it. Yeah. Now, that was the feeling back in February and central banks pretty much around the world had a really good look at this and said, look, there is some increase 
in inflation, but it seems to be related to bottlenecks due to COVID. In other words, lack of transporting goods and services. So there's high demand, but not much supply for certain uh, goods, and that leads to higher prices. Um, and so what uh, the RBA and 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 uh, the Fed in the US have said is that, look, this, this will wash out as the vaccine gets out and life returns to normal, these prices will reduce because the flow of goods and services will return to normal. And Joe, to be honest, the market has now accepted that reasoning as well. And if you're looking at uh, bond yields, which I know is not everyone's, uh, you know, pastime is to study what, you know, 10-year bond yields are doing. But do bond yields bounced up back in February on the expectation that interest rate was, uh, on the expectation both that inflation was high and interest rates would, would go up. Mm -hmm. But those bond yields have come back down now. Mm -hmm. And so really what, what the market, the collective view of the market is saying now, yep, we do expect interest rates to go up, but not quickly. Yep, yep. Uh, and not that soon. Yep. So the RBA is talking about the end of next year, mm -hmm. and you can expect the first interest rate movement to be like 0.25 basis points, and the next one, you know, a month or two later at 0.25 basis points. And the same with the, um, the the Feds over in the US. We expect interest rates to rise gradually um, and, and return to some level of Normalcy. normalcy not yeah. sure what what that level is but also expecting inflation to rise from its very low levels to get back to the rba's band of between two and three percent so taking the long-term view joe i know this was a long-winded answer but the long-term view is no we expect you know inflation and interest rates to normalize but to normalize gradually and you know it, it really shouldn't spook the market um but Yes, we can expect interest rates to, to start rising in so the think, next. So I think year that sounds two. sounds like it makes uh, it, it's positive news from the point of economic activity, um, um, but uh, it means that retirees will need to be patient before they see their um, you know their their bank accounts and their you know their interest bearing securities actually um, giving them anything um, that resembles anything like the past. Oh, absolutely, Joe. I think I think. Um, uh, a friend of mine is a financial advisor who's who's Irish, you know, a, a good Catholic Irish boy, and he's got clients who are still saying, "When when will interest rates go up to five or six percent like they used to?" And he says, "Where does it tell me in the Bible that interest rates should be at five <laughs> percent?" He says, "You know, that's 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 what was in the past. We don't know what's in the future, but." I think it'll be a long, long, long time before you see interest rates get back to that, where I expect interest rates to return to in the next two or three years is levels of around one and a half to two and a half percent, somewhere in that okay. kind of region. Yep. yep. So moving on around um, this, this new thing, green investing, you know, the idea yeah. that there's an increasing awareness and certainly from the, you know, the clients that are coming to us and um, talking about this, you know, ESG investment or, impact investment in recent years you know what are the differences between esg and impact investing and um does going down this route um actually ensure a greater level of performance from our investments yeah it's quite a lot of questions in the in yeah, there joe yeah, yeah, um yeah, so yeah. but it's a great starting point look let me let me just start off trying to keep this simple and relatively short which as you know is hard for me but you know, first of all <laughs> esg stands for environmental social and governance and it's been gaining in popularity for a couple of years typically what an esg investment will mean is you'll favor those stocks that have got good environmental records good um uh, are doing good socially and, and also have good governance um, records as well. And a lot of this you, you can do systematically. In other words, there are records on the environmental impacts that companies make. You know, you look at greenhouse gas emissions. It's, for most people, when, when they think of environmental issues, most people are going to talk, be talking about uh, global climate warming and greenhouse gas emissions. So an ESG investment is typically a fund or an ETF that favours those companies that have got good environmental scores. So as you'd expect then, it, it's probably going to favour a little bit like IT and, and uh, healthcare mm -hmm. companies, um, probably a bit neutral on banks, and it's probably going to 
uh, underweight, if you like, or, or not favour, you know, oil companies or companies that have big carbon footprints. Uh, uh, the social bit uh, is really sort of more what you term ethical investing. So the social means may not want to invest in companies that typically um, are not doing something that's socially responsible. So it could be tobacco, well, tobacco child labour, for instance. Uh, for some people, it might be alcohol and, and, and tobacco. Um, so it's a range of those social issues that people mm -hmm. are concerned about. And, and people with different social issues can find different funds that meet those records. And, and the last one is, is governance, which is you expect companies to behave um, ethically and, and have boards that are doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Impact investing is slightly different. So ESG is sort of a broad term for environmental, social and governance. And, and typically it's more about screening, screening out bad companies and mm -hmm. maybe favouring good companies. I impact investing is, is taking that next step along the path and going rather than having sort of a more broad brush approach and screening out just poorly based companies. I actually want to focus on companies that are doing good. So I might want to focus on companies that are investing in wind farms or companies that invest in solar energy. I might want to focus on uh, companies that are, are doing things around social housing, you know. So impact investing is is much more targeted at, at at the good, so completely avoiding what's seen as bad and, and targeting the good more specifically. Mm. Where ESG is a more general based approach that says, I'm gonna screen out companies that score poorly, typically on environmental uh, and social issues. Um, and then I might, you know, favor those companies that have got good environmental records. So that's, that's the essential difference between mm. ESG investing and impact investing. Mm impact is going to be a lot less diversified. It's going to be a, a lot more particular about the sort of investments you want to do. ESG is a broader brush approach. Um, but to be honest, Joe, for, for most investors, the ESG approach sort of meets most investors' aims, which is reduction in greenhouse gas emissions to do socially well and to have good governance in firms. So ESG investing probably satisfies most investors. But for those who then are more interested in making an impact, there's impact investing to help you really invest in that. Now, the second part of your question was, uh, are the returns going to be better or, or, or worse by going, let's say, in ESG or, or, or impact investing? The, the jury is out on this, Joe. Um, in general, I think it's best to assume that the returns are going to, the expected returns are going to be the same, e even though the path that you get to that return might be quite different. L let me give you a, a very um, broad example of how that might be the case. Uh, a, a sort of conventional portfolio might have a weighting to oil and energy that's the same as the weighting in the, in the general market. Whereas an ESG portfolio might completely underweight or get rid of oil companies from the portfolio. Now, last year, particularly, the oil price sank. You know, during the start of the pandemic, um, oil was all time low. And what that meant is the company, the, the funds that didn't own oil and energy companies did really well. So it looked like ESG companies were doing uh, ESG portfolios were doing really well where conventional portfolios were not doing so well. Since that time, oil has increased, oil's now back up and it's actually had a phenomenal return. It's up about oh, 80% in the last 12 months, you know, coming off lows, but oil's right back up again. And guess what? The more conventional portfolios are doing really well mm. and the ESG portfolios are not doing as well. Turns out that their return over periods of a couple of years are about the same, but they got there differently. differently. And so if you're an ESG investor, I think the, the way to think about it is I'm not giving up expected return, but my path to get to my return will be different than if I just look at, you know, a broad benchmark abroad if i'm just looking at the all lords that will you know have such and such a return mm. in the next couple of years and my esg portfolio might have the same return at the yes. end of 
a couple of years, but it will have got there in a different way. And so as an investor, you need to be aware of that uh, difference. It's what in the business we call a, a tracking error. How so, much, how different are you going to look to the market? So to put, put it simply, you know, if you're talking to your friends about their superannuation return and you're in an ESG fund, it might be vastly different to what they might be in, given they might be just in a, in a market-based fund. Or if you're listening to the news on a day-to-day -day basis and you're listening to what the S&P 500 has done and the ASX 300 and so on and so forth, your portfolio might be doing a lot different to that in the short run. Um, but over time, because you are still broadly diversified, the expected return is likely to be quite similar. I think that's absolutely right, Joe. That 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 is my contention. That again, we don't have that much evidence to make this as a definite statement because ESG funds are Not relatively new. Yep, 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 yep. Um, but the evidence that we have looked at, and and the sort of the uh, scenarios that that other people have done, looking back in time, would say that we expect the um, returns to be very similar over time. But the path that you get there will be will be different. Yeah. So Steve, I, you know, I, I just wanted to ask you, you know, this is a bit of a different question, but casting your mind back to your 10 year old self, what do you think, what advice would you have given yourself back then about investing now that you've been a financial market expert for quite some time? <laughs> you know, Joe, as my 10 year old self, um, nothing really went beyond much about the football. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and my 20 year old self, nothing went beyond the football and girls, but you know, <laughs> where, um, if I do look back on, on sort of the lessons that I've, I've probably, um, learned and now take, take with me, um, and wish I had known earlier, uh, when I was doing that PhD show way back in, uh, in the early eighties, my, my grandfather passed and, um, you know, I inherited, you know, $10,000 from from his estate, which wasn't a lot of money. But back in the early 80s, I could have bought half a house in Canberra for, um, for $10,000. But I went to um, I went to a, a financial advisor and said, look, man, I, I got this $10,000. I don't want to do it. And they did exactly the right thing. They put me in a diversified pool of stocks, a few bonds, gold, had a bit of everything. And this would have been in 86, uh, 1986. And the fellow showed me a chart then of the stock market on this incredible run up and up and up. And he said, I don't want to scare you, but this is what happened in you know 1929. It went up and up and up and up. And then there was the Great Depression. And, and so this financial advisor did everything right. Put me in a good diversified portfolio, showed me the risk that the you know, market's on a run at the moment, but you know there are it's a possibly, you know, a balloon out there happening. So yeah, be watch it. Anyway, I go, yeah, 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 fine, fine. This is great. You know, I'll, you know, I'll, this is, I'll, I'll use this when I'm older, but I went to the U S in, uh, in 1987, I was just finishing my PhD and had a bit of a tour of the U S and, you know, was looking to get a, a job over there. And I was actually in New York in, uh, in uh, October 87, we were at this big uh, convention center for a conference and suddenly everyone left the room and they were standing around the TV monitors out in the lobby of the hotel. And I kind of walked out because it was an optical fiber conference. It had nothing to do with finance, you know, going, you know, what the hell's going on and walked out there. And once I looked at the screen and it, it was, you know, Wall Street live and the market falling down, you know, and it was hysteria and people were running out, you know, getting on their phone, well, they probably didn't even have mobile phones back in those days, but you know, it was kind of this, um, you, you know, this mania had overtaken New York about the markets falling down. Of course, I didn't think anything of it, except it was really fun to be a part of it, and what a great experience. And anyway, I got back to Australia and found out that my ten thousand dollars had turned into four thousand dollars while I, in the four weeks I'd been away. And on top of that, I had a $2,000 credit card bill from traveling around the state. So of course I did the only thing a young man could do, which is I took the $4,000 out, paid off the credit card and drank the rest. <laughs> and I look back now, and of course that $4,000 again recovered within a year back to the $10,000. And the $10,000 back in I don't know, 1987 or 88 or 89, and I look at what that would be worth now. It would be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars in my superannuation account. So I always look at that, Joe, as now a, 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 
a professional uh, finance uh, consultant and go, that is a life lesson about the power of compounding and the power that markets do go up, but they do go down, but they do go up again. And when you find a crisis, you know, we talked earlier about the GFC, very scary for people. The pandemic, probably too quick for people to even know what was going on, but either way, very scary for people when markets fall that far. What do you do when markets fall? You do nothing. You leave your money where it is, unless you absolutely need that cash, then do nothing and just let it do its work. The markets recover and compounding will will help you reach these goals at the end when it, when you need them, when you're in your 60s. Mm. Say, say a great story, sage advice. Um, I think uh, there are so many lessons in this one. I don't even know how to chop this episode up, to be honest. Um, but, uh, you know, really appreciate you being on. And it wouldn't be an It's Never About Money uh, episode if I didn't ask a question which is a little strange, but um, what your spirit animal would be and why, um, Steve? I'm not sure what you're going to say here. What the spirit animal would be? Mm. That's a great mm. question, Joe. So is it Steve? I'm not sure if it is, but, you know, it just, you know, something to, something to change it up at the end of the, at the, end of the episode. <laughs> at the end of the episode, you, you know, Joe, I am uh, in a great position in life. So I live by Surf Beach here in Manly in Sydney. And four mornings a week, I'm up at 5.30 and I'm running around the beach with a bunch of old fellas like myself. Believe me, it's nothing really to look at. And, <laughs> and we run up the beach from one end, from Manly to Queenscliff, and then we run back down and we do push-ups and sit-ups and then we jump on our racing boards and get out there in, in the surf. Uh, and then in the evening, I'm surrounded by cafes and restaurants and I live here in pump with my, my wife, Dana. I've got two beautiful daughters, um, one uh, at university and the other one who's just returned from London, just working in PR. And you think, gee whiz, you know, life is, life is pretty good you know, may, may long it continue. So when you ask my, my animal spirit, uh, you know, it, it, it's pretty close to, um, to where I am. You know, I'm, there's not too many things I'd want to change, Joe. <laughs> so is there a particular animal though that we're talking about that would, would, would uh, there's a jellyfish in the background there on your... Uh, there is a jellyfish. Um, a jellyfish. If, if you see me running uh, on the beach in the morning, that's pretty close approximation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to uh to what you see so he, he, oh, so what's the animal spirit you know wow that's such a good question joe um i could say you know a lion or a tiger but probably my wife would say uh yeah either the jellyfish or a uh, maybe a sea cucumber someone <laughs> plays there and doesn't move much <laughs> Oh, I want to go with the lion and tiger. Yeah, well, we all do. We all do. We all do, Steve. <laughs> well, thanks very much for coming on. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, real, real valuable. And um, I'm sure everyone got a lot out of it. Thanks, Steve. Terrific. Thank you, Joe. Well, that was Dr. Steve Garth, member of the Stefan Independent Advisory Investment Committee and now apparently also a jellyfish. That was part two of our two-part investment series. If you missed part one, have a listen to it online. It is full of interesting investment insights. I hope that this one was enjoyable to listen to and there were some moments of value. If you have resonated in any way with the sentiments of this podcast, we would be delighted to direct you to our website, www.itsneveraboutmoney.com.au for more free resources and education aimed at improving your capacity to make sound financial decisions for the benefit of your family. We wish you every success, however you define it.